Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classical Revolution here on IDECIO. My name is Rachel Fenlon. I'm a Berlin-based uh, classical soprano and pianist. And in my series here, I am exploring what it means to be thinking outside the classical music genre and sort of chatting with weekly guests who are really inspiring me to um who are really inspiring in general um in pushing these boundaries and and asking the questions about what defines this genre and what and what redefines this genre so um and i'm having a, having a really wonderful time and today i'm so excited uh, to invite uh, Nicole Lise. Um, Nicole is a fellow Canadian. She's a Montreal-based uh, composer, performer, and video artist, whose compositions range from works for orchestra and solo turntable featuring notated DJ techniques to unorthodox instrumental combinations, multimedia, and works including like, vintage board games and karaoke tapes. Um, her commission list includes over 50 works for ensembles such as the Kronos Quartet, Carnegie Hall, the New York Philharmonic, San Francisco uh, Symphony, Vancouver Symphony, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, the Royal Albert Hall. Um, and she has been awarded the very prestigious Prix Opus um, Award in very recent years, as well as the SOCAN Foundation Award, which is uh, another prestigious award for Canadian composers. And her discography is, is also very extensive um, with multiple albums under different labels. Um, so with not much further to say, uh, please welcome Nicole Lise. Hi, Nicole. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's great to be here. It's so nice to have you. Thank you for making time and, and calling in here from, are you coming from Montreal? I am. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So welcome. Um, I like to begin the show right off the bat by asking my guests what their first or what your first introduction to music was and whether there was a specific moment that sparked what is now your lifelong um, sort of passion and curiosity for music. Yeah, well, I think primarily um, the biggest the biggest impact on why I do what I do was definitely because I was sort of born into a scenario of um, malfunctioning electronics. My dad is a electronics repairman, collector, and uh, salesman, and has been for much of his life. And nothing, and never threw anything away. So by the time I came around, there was so much of this technology in the house. And I grew up in the '70s and '80s, and this was the time. There was a, a golden age of technology at that time. There was a lot of invention, a lot of thinking, forward thinking but a lot of the technology didn't work properly or it didn't work according to the manual or, or consumer um, for consumer purposes. Uh, so I, I was just surrounded by glitching sounds and visuals and this became the norm for me. I, I gravitated towards it, it saturated my brain and I knew this was from a very early age and it never left. I knew that these sounds were real sounds. They were, they had a lot of personality. These machines for me um, were emotional. You know, there, there, was a, there was a lot of, there was a lot of content in there that just didn't leave. So I, I, from a young age, I knew I wanted to merge this with humans, real instruments and have each in, inform the other. So musicians becoming, um, inspired by glitch, taking on those characteristics, and then also having, bringing the machine into the concert hall or in, within the chamber ensemble so that it becomes an actual member of the ensemble. So this was constantly in my, in my environment, coupled with the fact that I grew up listening to my parents' extensive record collection of primarily easy, what's called easy listening and soundtrack <laughs> music. Mm -hmm. fast fast collection um of crazy stuff really i still maintain it's trippy you know crazy orchestrated kind of music um and then and then a lot of classical music and a lot of rock and pop i was just completely open open to all sound and images i think it's so fascinating um 
and it, interesting that it was so broad and from such an early age, that combination of, I mean, did you also train classically or musically young as well? And, or when did the, when did the musician, did you, yeah, did you train, how early did you train as a musician? Yeah, there were other normal instruments in the house. There was a piano, there was a uh, guitar. Um, so the, my first instrument was, was piano. Um, and I took piano lessons from a young age. Um, it's, and then, yeah, and then sort of gradually added more, you know, the, I started learning guitar when I was 16. I got a drum kit when I was 13, um, you know, and sort of started merging these uh, normal instruments with all of the malfunctioning technology and um, yeah. I find it really fascinating um, what you do, particularly your philosophy on sort of um, these malfunctioning instruments. Um, reading some of your interviews or, or watching some of them um, to prepare this, I find it really interesting that you have this philosophy about the afterlife of these, of these instruments or these things or these I mean, what would you call them? Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about how you how you approach the afterlife of these instruments or these broken things. Yeah, well, I refer to that. It's it's, it's interesting because it, these machines were are analog, and they were constructed in such a way so that they would last. You know, they would. There was a lot of attention put into them. A lot of them had wood paneling. Um, you know, there was, there was details, there's very tangible, a lot of beauty in them. Um, so they were built to last. They would never sort of just mm. quit there, that they would just, it was not like digital where, whether it's, it's, it's zero and one, it's either alive or it's, it's dead, right? It's, it's, there's a, yeah. what I call, what I call purgatory in the analog world. So they're in purgatory where they're no <laughs> longer useful for the, for the outside, you know, for the, in, in the usual, its usual capacity, what it is intended to do it sort of be, has become a little bit, um, it has rebelled and is still making sounds and noises and they're fascinating, but it's not functional anymore. anymore. So that there's a sort of, I think of it as a kind of, they're set free, there's a, there's a freedom uh, with that because they're no longer conforming to, not that there's anything wrong with a, a functioning piece of machinery, mm -hmm. um, but but there's something about, you know, the, the sound of a tube tape or the sound of a RCA selective vision <laughs> Which, which you know, came to into popularity for a short time in the late seventies, and didn't last. They would glitch, so the visuals were saturating with color, and they would be chopped up. And this, you know, for me, they it was misbehaving. The the, mm -hmm. the machine mm -hmm. and the media were both misbehaving and and rebelling, and were in a sort of purgatory, and were prime for for using it, for you know. Um, embracing it as a, an instrument in its own right. I love that. That's it's such a it's such a cool image, and also it's just such a unique uh, approach. And what's particularly unique about it also is that you're merging it with this classical music world, like not not you know performance art or, but you're really merging it with such an art with such an art form. Um, one thing I'm curious about uh, to hear you talk about is, can you talk a little bit about why notating these in, these sounds, these instruments, these foreign um, objects, or not objects, but these machines, why notating it is important, an important part of the process for you? But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um well, that's a great question because it is, um, it's not just about having the machine there. It, I really wanted for it, for it to have, to, for it to completely coexist uh, alongside a chamber group to be an equal partner um, mm -hmm. in, that, in that scenario. And for that to happen, um, notation is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. um, it pushes, it, it sort of, it does a number of things. It, it sort of, it, it does that primarily where it's, it, it, if it's in the score, it is necessary for it to be there and it informs everything this way and this way. And there's interaction with the musicians. And when the musicians are interacting um, with something that's behaving so irrationally, um, but yet is notated, um, 
they need to synchronize with that or that it's everything is informed by the other. So it encourages, uh, it sort of creates a rabbit hole. It sort of encourages the musician to also behave incorrectly. So that's why my scores are, are not, nothing is quantized. I don't want anything softened. I want everything to be in, embraced for what it is. So the musician um, will have to synchronize with that and we'll have to merge with that or sometimes clash with that, but it's never, it's never arbitrary. So the, the notation, you know, there's changes of meter all over the place. There's, you know, or changes of meter, changes of tempo, whatever it takes to embrace the heart of the instrument and allow it to fully ent enter the concert hall and become a partner with everybody yes. else. Actually that now hearing, you say that really makes so much sense because if you have the instrument there and it's not um, as it's not integrated the same way with notation, then it can be a part of the dialogue. But I love what you say about it has to, it doesn't require behaving. Like, and so I think that's a, such an interesting point um, that with the notation, it requires, there's like limitations that come with that for everyone involved. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. super interesting. So what happens is that the, the mal the mistakes or the malfunction that's written into the part, into the perform into the human performer's part, um, these are mistakes, but they're notated, and so there's an unnatural or a different way of thinking for for me. Uh, it creates they have to be incredibly precise, the players, in order you know, both not in, in terms of rhythm and and harmony, but also in terms of um, dynamics and expression. Everything is shifted. So for me. It's, it's going down a different sort of portal to a different way of looking at chamber music or notation mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, in an interview that you gave for the Kronos Quartet, um, I think it was when you were doing a two-year residency with them um, as a composer, or you were in your second year writing works for them. Um, you speak about what you admire about the Kronos Quartet is the, is their reimagining of what a string quartet is, and that's definitely something that you're doing in your work. You're reimagining sometimes what an orchestra is. Or, and one of my questions is: Do you ever does that ever extend to space? Like, um, do you ever reimagine performance spaces? Or, I mean, how far does that go for you in your work? Or how much further do you want it to go as well? Yeah, that's a that's a great question because that is something that's not always at a composer's disposal. Like it's not always available, right? The the yeah. the, the time or the uh, invitation maybe to to sort of play with the space. But that has sort of become a um, a factor or a a feature more and more in in pieces from the past several years. Um, when working with an orchestra. There's, there's often, you know, the, there's the logistical side of things that is shifting, but there's a logistical side of things that there's not always the time. I mean, it's just yeah. something, you know, so there are parameters within which to work, but something like opera, which is very recent, um, uh, you know, I've, well, it's been a, a few years now that I've been writing for opera. Um, this is where uh, that way of thinking, rethinking the way opera is presented, mm -hmm. based, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, what is considered, um, you know, again, from, from both the vantage point of the audience, what is, you know, and the musicians that are usually, for example, that are usually there to provide accompaniment. But in recent operas, and I'm working on an opera now, where the musicians are very much part of the, the fabric of, or the story, they're very much part of the yeah. story. Yeah. Um, and they also, I mean, just speaking a little bit about the opera I'm, I'm working on now, they are, and it's a little difficult to describe this, but that's always a good sign. Um, yes. <laughs> they, are, they are there to bring inanimate objects to life. So they're in unexpected places and provide, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I like surprises and I like bringing um, in, inanimate objects to life. I like bringing life to different parts of the room. <laughs> you know places that you would in the concert hall or any other venue that you would tend to ignore but suddenly if a musician's there or a singer's there or a machine is there something it brings it it creates um it brings it to life and so it becomes part of the fabric of the whole scenario mm -hmm. 
So, I, I mean, Kronos Quartet is very much from the beginning, there were the, the, um, the possibilities are endless. I mean, there was a completely open mindedness as far as all aspects, all musical aspects, all, you know, the way you experience um, the quartet. It, it, it's, and that's one, that's a thing that, that's, um, that's, that's absolutely necessary in order to, 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 you know, embrace the scope of a, of a, of a project and move forward. Exactly. And maybe yeah. even also just to evolve as a genre, to evolve as a musical ensemble or, yeah. Um, yeah. Going back to the point, just there was something you said that, that caught me, which was this, you know, this, the turning the focus point um, in a concert hall on something that you would never usually notice. And it made me think that it makes, or it made me wonder what that awareness changes in, for an audience member in, I mean, have you experienced that yourself or do you have an example of, you know, when something did shift or when that unexpected thing came in the room, what that did to you? I'm, I'm curious. Um, well, I could speak to the, to the, especially with the opera I did la last year in, um, in Banff. So I was there um, sort of in the corner to, um, to sort of witness the audience rea audience's reactions to specific moments. Cause there were a lot of these where, for example, I'll give you an example. Yes. Uh, there's a scene with us, with the singer in a coffin. The coffin is closed. Uh, the percussionist is playing the coffin as a percussion. It's, so I, I really have to emphasize that items aren't there just for gratuitously, just for to be there. I, or they can be, I mean, there's something about set design and everything, but mm -hmm. I want, I love for the set design to surprisingly become part of the music itself and it's scored. So the coffin part was scored for the percussionist to play and the bass player, I had a string, I'd asked the builders of the coffin to have a string there so that he could bow it. And this is not just bowing, it becomes part of the score. It's the music, it needs to be there or else there's gonna be a blank you know, space where the music should be because it's on the coffin. So anyway, so the singer's in the coffin, she's singing in the coffin and it creates this beautiful otherworldly filter because it's there as a filter. It's a thick coffin, um, it's opened a little bit and you can hear this, this coffin-esque filter and then gradually it opens and she emerges. So to see, you know, the set design become instruments and see the, the audience's reactions it's playing, it's playing sonically while vis playing with the visuals at, yeah. the same, at the same time. And yeah, there was, you know, they were, they were, they were surprised, but it also lends itself to extended techniques or whatever, you know, yeah. ways, of coloring, yeah, sure. ways of coloring and, and enhancing the sonically what, what things will, the, the effect of them, that filter. I mean, I want that coffin filter. Yeah. In, Many of my pieces, you know, and and the and the bowing of the cotton. I mean, it, the way or the, the coffin, the way it resonated because the coffin is so large and it's wood and it's a beautiful sound that can only be that coffin, mm -hmm. you know. So there are a lot of examples of that in in this opera and 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 the opera coming up and then other pieces where I where I like to surprise the audience or or put sounds in, in unexpected places, but not. I has to be there as part of the of the score generally. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's so fascinating. It's really it's. Um, do you feel like you're always? I mean, yeah. I, it just makes me think. You know, are you sort of like in a, in a usual day in your life, sort of noticing sounds all the time and thinking like, oh, that coffee machine is making making a weird noise. <laughs> take on this. I mean, is that sort of in your periphery in your yeah, it's yeah. yeah, it's a little yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, our house um, is full of things from the past, much much of them, um, the present too, that have potential to be um, performers. You know, things that there, there's you know pop rock candy everywhere because pop rocks is from the past, but it has its own distinctive <laughs> sound that I've used in opera, and it's it it has to be. It's a sound that can only be created by by what it is. So using, for example, the board games that I use a lot of, um, it, it's not, pardon? No, no, sorry. I was just oh. saying. 
So then the example of, of the board games in the opera, the opera last year. So, you know, the, the, there's a performer, he's singing in a room and there are board games there and you think nothing of the board games, but um, this is the game operation. That's quite an old, an old board game that makes a sound. <laughs> So he takes it and it becomes part of his aria in rhythmic, you know, it's very, very rhythmic. And that sound, the, the, the beauty of all of this too is that members of the audience, um, and it varies around the world, but there will, there will always be members of the audience coming to me afterwards and they will have a reaction to that sound. Many of them will remember that from when they were young or, you know, and there's always that those connotations and that connection that makes it really personal and makes it really emotional for me. It, it is for me. And then when it extends to the audience, um, it, it just makes it that more multidimensional when it reaches people emotionally that, like that. And it becomes necessary. People that want to perform the pieces have to go out and find this old, vintage, obsolete, you know, forgotten, no longer useful device. Mm -hmm. And they bring it into their um, practice space and they learn the notation and they learn how to work it and everything. And if they need it, they have to travel with it. Like Kronos Quartet has a whole suitcase of my, you know, my, my stuff, my thing, you know, that they need. Um, and that yeah. is, you know, it becomes part of the, the lack of a better word, the family or the, 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 yeah. the ensemble, they need it, you know? I mean, when you say it like this, it, in, it really, it, these things become instruments. It's like, in a way, it's so, I mean, not, I mean this in the best way, but it's almost so obvious because it's like, they're so, they have emotional properties. Um, it has this nostalgic, I mean, there's so much emotion in nostalgia and, and yeah, why shouldn't these things that we interact with every day also become a part of our musical dialogue? I think it's, it's actually, I mean, in the best way, it's so, it makes so much sense. Yeah. And I also feel strongly because a lot of these, a lot of these things I'm talking about, a lot of the machines, a lot of the old games, they're in landfills now. You know, much of, they're, they're no longer, because they're replaced by digital. It's much easier. And I'm not, just nothing disparaging against digital because of course oh I use God. digital every day too. Yeah. But all of these things have just been sort of, um, rejected. They're, they're, they are no longer up to date. They are antiquated. But so a lot of them are in landfills and they're still, they still work. Many of them still work. They're, they were built wow. to last. So, you know, I want to rejuvenate. I, I, yeah. I, you know, rejuvenate them, bring them, bring them back. Give know? them a voice. Yeah. 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 And also, I mean, there's, there's like, when you say that, it's, I even feel it, there's like this element of tragedy because you're like, you know, I'll never use a tape player again. Um, and there's kind of, there's something sad about that. So it's, it's really cool. It's really cool what you're doing. Um, I want to, I want to read a quote of yours. <laughs> Don't, and I'm gonna read it so that I don't paraphrase it. <laughs> Sorry that I'm doing this. I know some people don't like this. Um, and you say, so this isn't the same, no, sorry, this isn't a documentary that you did for Music on Main. They did a short 10, 12 minute, really nice documentary on you and your work. And, and you say a work shouldn't be bound by pre-existing notions of what is a classical work or a concert music work. And so I'm curious, have you faced obstacles in this kind of thinking? Um, because I absolutely agree with you, but I find that within the classical music world, um, that mentality is really hard to sort of, um, to maintain or fight for. So I, I was just, yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Yeah, there has been, yeah, I mean, um, I had these notions, um, even though they needed refinement, you know, from a young age, I had ideas and, and certainly as an adult, uh, you know, my notation skills as, you know, they needed refinement in order to completely, you know, realize this, this, these ideas. But I, I had an, a, a strong idea of what I wanted to happen, chamber music wise and music and, and you know, as, as a whole, music, what, what is that, or visuals, what is that? And so, 
yeah, I would say certainly, um, well, I mean, when my, my, my thesis was a, a, a turntable concerto and that essentially um, divided the faculty uh, at McGill because it wasn't considered a legitimate or, a, you know, it was, comp you know, many reasons. It wasn't considered a legitimate art form, turntablism. Um, I had to devise a notation for it. You know, I devised a notation, that's what I wanted to do. I mm -hmm. completely wanted to take this instrument that is not acceptable or normally acceptable. But for me, and I was 20, in my early 20s at the time, um, it, it didn't, you know, I had blinders on it. It didn't even concern me that it was unacceptable. I knew what I wanted to do. It had meaning for me and that's all that mattered. So I was unfortunate in that. I had those blinders, yeah. but certainly, but certainly, it was not. Um, you know, it, it, there were there were people that that didn't think of it as a as a legitimate art form or or a merging. You know, fusing turntablism and chamber music. You know, it, it completely um, was un unacceptable. Or you know, and then now that now there's a there's you know. People know when they commission a piece from me, what, you know, they know what my aesthetic is, they know, and they have, I think, the thing is, I, if something is going to be um, presented in, in such a context, I'm going to make sure that it's very uh, thoughtful, it's all well thought out, it's not just there <laughs> arbitrarily, never. Um, so there's a faith that, you know, they, they know what they, what I, what I do, and so I don't often come up against that anymore but I did yeah. a bit when they're, you know, orchestras were open. Okay, let's have a turntablist or let's have a drummer in the concert hall. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, you know, uh, yeah, there were, there were some, some um, you know, uh, some, some, I came across some obstacles that I had yeah. to just believe. I believed in, in myself, again, the blinders and, and the, the, the believing it. Yeah. Believing in myself and, and, and always moving forward. But yeah, I mean, for a long time in my 20s, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and even 15 years ago, there, there, yeah, were a lot of, you know, yeah, this, sure. Yeah. I, yeah, yes. I, I mean, of course, I mean, those, you, you know, you can't, um, you can't break rules without uh, dividing people. So, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but still, I found this, especially this thought, just very interesting about, you know, really facing the genre and, and, and saying, I mean, because then it, even what you say there, it even extends for me to something like Beethoven or something, because it, it shouldn't be bound by our pre-existing ideas of what that work is. And so I just thought it was such a great quote because it's like, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're evolving all the time as, as, um, as people, and so, uh, so 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 should the music. And yeah, and, and and just further to that, yeah, I I, I think with a, why for me speaking personally, why go through all that? I mean, doing a score, you know, a score with visuals. Why would I want to sort of rehash or regurgitate what has been done before? It's a lot of work. Uh, yeah. I firmly, if, in order for me to do all of that, I have to believe in it fully, a hundred percent, and mm -hmm. and. Even from a young age, all everybody I admired um, were came up against real, you know, real obstacles and real criticism for thinking differently. That's the way it's going to always be. And I admired all of those people. Anybody, any from any art form, whether it's filmmaking, music, you know, visual arts, authors, every everybody that I've admired from from almost the beginning of time came up against, you know, somebody like Kubrick on hate mail. You know, it, it's just, that's the way things, if, if something doesn't, um, if, if something is, is new to be, to be, you know, if something is new, it's going to be met with, what is this? We, we expected something that has already existed, like uh, is there, it's fine when it exists already. But for me, art should be moving forward. Um, I'm speaking just, you know, personally. And yeah, I, wanna hear, I wanna hear an artist's voice. I wanna hear something that doesn't necessarily have an audience yet. And again, anybody I've admired, they created their own audience. The audience wasn't there waiting for them. They, I love it, yeah, it was, they almost, yeah. yeah. 
So, and that's the stuff that is not watered down. It doesn't cater. It doesn't, nope. you know, it com comes from the heart. And especially if you're not doing it to join some, you know, to join something that's already has an audience or has, it's acceptable or you're meeting the, the expectations or the preconceived notions of a certain group of people. Um, not to say that art can't be created that way too, but again, I think it's, for me, it's more impactful if there's something personal to be said. And usually that happens when you take risks and decide for yourself. And it's really a risk, risky. And that's yeah. always the art that has moved me the most because it's, it just, you're thinking you're in here rather than- It's so, okay. it's so personal. It's so personal. Yeah, it, and you're not sure, and there's all, you know, and any, again, I read a lot of, you know, I, I've always had um, sort of gained inspiration from reading autobiographies of various, you know, even inventors, video, video game inventors. I'm reading a lot of that right now from the beginning, from, you know, and these are, this is for me, the epitome of the, the inventor they were building, there was nothing that existed before, video, like the first video games. Not only did they have to create it narratively and the way it looked, but they had to make a machine and everything had to support it. So it had to be, so it could be, um, you know, it could be sold, but they, it, it was sold, but nobody knew what that was yet. They didn't know what they wanted yet, the, the, the audience, you know? And mm -hmm. so they, they, these inventors completely invented something absolutely did not exist there were games like there were you know books and games but video games they had to invent that fully and that for me is that's the hardest thing that's like conceptually and realizing it technically is a beautiful a beautiful thing and never easy yeah exactly i mean ex yeah let alone realizing it technically but <laughs> which is just yeah but now oh, that's so interesting yeah. because also it means um I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it means then you really also have to just have faith in this vision and you have to have faith that the audience would come, but not, yeah, I mean, it's, and also these video game inventors, you know, they're spending all their time developing something and trusting that people are going to want to use it and enjoy it. And, and you have no idea because people, it hasn't in, it, it been invented yet. They are currently inventing it. So yeah. It's the same with so many things like thrash metal. <laughs> and I grew up listening to a lot of thrash metal and there's no audience. Nobody right. knew. Thrash metal was completely new. You know, it came from, I don't go into great detail about this, but it came from, you know, certainly there were, you know, there was a foundation for it in early um, hard rock music, but actual thrash metal, it, there was no, it completely invented a sound and they're a composer they're you know this yeah this you don't know because there's nobody's telling you oh do this because it, there's you know mm -hmm. it's a way to make money or what, whatever you know but, yeah and I mean I guess I think you know part of like what I'm talking about in this series and, and chatting when I have my, my guests every week is like why we don't do it that much or in I feel not enough in the classical music world um and i suppose it is it does i wonder whether it also comes from that place of you know we're, we're kind of a, a a niche art form and there's sometimes we're approaching it a bit like it's i mean at least in north america it's a bit like it's a bit endangered you know um, we have to be careful with with taking risks but um so it's so i guess all of that to say it can be harder to have faith uh, in the classical genre specifically. I mean, but I think that goes in any genre, but talking specifically about that, it makes me, it really makes me think about um, just about what that risk taking really requires because it's essentially saying to a, a promoter or saying, you know, take this gamble, but I don't know if you'll have your audience. And for North America, that's, that's almost, sometimes a risk they can't take. So yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a complex um, mm -hmm. topic, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I've been doing this long enough to, to have experienced the way programming 
was before in the, in the 90s and the way it is now. I mean, and there are steps being taken, especially, and not by everybody, that's, that's, that's for sure. I think, I think it's important for an artist to recognize the way to, to the steps um, necessary to move forward. So there are groups of people, there are opera companies that have the vision and have the, oh yeah, um, many things, the, the capabilities, because that's important to, to be able to support an idea that's, out, that's out there. But there are, you know, young companies um, that are, well, you know, are not young, but companies that are, that are just willing, that want that and, and, and are fully on board and there's a, then they don't even know what's going to, um, they can't predict. It's unpredictable, right? Mm -hmm. But that's how things have, that, that's how things have always, like we talked about this, but how things have always moved forward. So there are people that share, speaking for myself, that share my, um, that notion of, yeah, we're going to, you have to try this. Um, you're going to have to trust me. It's, you know, it's, it, it's experimenting, but it, it, it you can't. It's unpredictable. But a lot of things, you know, I could name so many things. So many, you know, things that I initially people were thinking thought it was it was a crazy idea. And but it's it's always about the support you have. I think I've been, you know, I I can. There's groups of people that, and Kronos is one of them, and Tapestry is another one of them, and you know, I could name where you just know from speaking with them and the way we interact and the, the way we, we have meetings and the, everything that there is an excitement about the same things. It's not about talking about, well, we don't really want to, or we don't really want to, and we can't, you know, never that. It's always, you know, oh, what about, oh, what about? And then it's all, when that project is done, we're thinking about what's next. It's excitement. It's never, oh, that's it. One performance great now we can check that out you know it's not never about that with with certain groups of people so i have now i'm, I'm happy to say you know that a, a list of you know i have a, a great um colleagues that i that i that i know feel believe in in the same things and i can i can recognize that even in new collaborations because i also welcome new collaborations and i can always recognize that that spirit and that will and young you know young people i, I meet I, I meet people i i can tell the difference i still meet the ones where oh no you know lots of no or you know it, it's different i can t i can't put it really articulate but there is a big difference between when i see the glimmering spirited you know yeah let's you know so those are the people i gravitate towards for sure and i can i've been doing this long enough that i can recognize the uh you know the spirit sure. is willing yeah <laughs> yeah and no i mean it also then you know it goes it says that it's also about the community that you build and it's about um the community that we build as musicians and and really um yeah really seeking seeking that seeking the people that really um, that you kind of can share philosophy with and also challenge one another definitely. Um, I, I want to make sure I ask you. I want to make sure I ask you about about film music because I see a from your playlist, um, which everyone should check out. Uh, it's linked below this episode, um, and, and also from the work that you're doing and. It, it specifically also from songs that I want to do with yours at some point, the, the malfunction leader, um, but that film has a big influence for you as, as an artist and as a, as a composer. So um, yeah, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, um, about, about how film incorporates into your, into your work and where those lines are. Sure. Yeah. Well, some of the machines that I was speaking about earlier, they were VHS and beta machines. And um, this was at the beginning of, you know, uh, yeah, movies, films being available to purchase for your own home viewing pleasure. And it was, you know, so there was a specific, um, you know, it gradually more and more titles were, were made available. But I, I grew up, you know, my parents 
watch the same movies over and over. And when they were available on uh, videotape, of course, watching things over and over meant that they would degrade fairly quickly, you know. And so something that, you know, so many things happened. It was, it's really, yeah, I, I've been fascinated by, by, some, by film music and film specifically um, for, me, for many reasons. Both the, the, I, was, I was fortunate in that my, my parents did watch um, certain types of movies. They watched a lot of Hitchcock. So I was exposed to that from a very young age. I was exposed to things I probably shouldn't see, have seen. I saw The Exorcist when I was really young. I saw um, Alien when I was really, but really important movies that had, you know, so much depth to them and, and risk taking for sure and all of them. Um, so that was happening and the tapes were degrading. So I'd watch the films and these were great films to begin with, but then they'd start to take on another life. Another narrative was going on, another, you know, because it was sort of the, the, the tape, the media was hacking the director's intentions a little bit. Well, a lot. So oh, things would start to fight or skip altogether or the, the colors would saturate. Um, many things happened. And so uh, it, it, it created its own narrative, narrative with the narrative. And it was never, it, uh, it, next time I watched the same film, something else would happen. Or, you know, after a four more plays or after, you know. Um, so it really, that really made an impression. So many things happened there. Both, I became fascinated and, and almost obsessed in, in, for many, in many ways with the, compo with, with the um, directors and cinematograph cinematographers that I was exposed to. And I wanted to, when I was able to, you know, later, I would discover on my own. So I got into Lynch later, I got it, you know, all mm -hmm. into all these. And, and it was, for me, it was a different sort of risk taking, unexpected, especially the, you know, things like, like, like Lynch, no one can predict that. It's so, you know, well crafted everything, but you cannot predict, predict that storyline. And I, as a, you know, a teen and a 20 year old, that was everything. It, it came from the same place where I would l listen to, when I was, you know, listening to classical music, you know, discovering it, I couldn't have predicted the, the direction of many, you know, you can in some case, but not, you know, I couldn't have predicted Leggetti atmosphere. Like, no, I heard it, that after, after, you know, being obsessed with Chopin as a, you know, as a kid for the most, you know, and then here, and this is classical, these are, you know, this is a right. orchestra too, you know. Um, so yeah, so, so to, yeah, so the, the, the media overtaking, um, hacking the composer's vision, um, the, 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 the directors themselves, the auteurs having their own language and how <laughs> that affected my, my writing. Like I would read, you know, technique books, analysis books of film. And, and really, it just, it just really informed, even before I was using film when I was much younger, um, the way that Hitchcock approached design, contour and, and shot selection. And he would speak, I mean, he had a very close relationship with his composers too but it's almost separate I, I and I do like film music too but I think of mm -hmm. um, just film for purely film's sake and how mm -hmm. the way Hitchcock you know approached filming a, a movie a scene and seeing the storyboards and everything and applying that to to a written score the way the score looks the way the score is shaped the way um, the characters in a score um, are treated within the fabric of the score. It really, I, I just, it, it formed many, many ways. So, <clears throat> so yeah, many, many things going on. And so when I started my, uh, my series, the, the etudes, starting with Hitchcock etudes, yes. I wanted to both embrace the glitch, what glitch can do within um, uh, sort of a, a, a well-known film or, or, or well, you know, a, a very auteur driven director's vision, you know, and, and it harnesses what, how I experienced Hitchcock, both in terms of the media, creating its own narrative, mm -hmm. and also the director, the way that the director would treat um, his shot selection, etc. cetera. I, mm -hmm. I also consider okay. that when I was, yeah. Oh, so interesting. And I mean, so, I mean, like, I want to talk about, like, just checking the time, um, because this is, it's so fascinating. Um, 
Well, okay, so going, thinking about specifically this point when it enters your music. Um, and I, now I'm thinking again of the, the leader that, you, that you've written for soprano, piano, and then it's um, video. Um, and you're using uh, the sound of music, this moment, this Maria moment on the hill for a part of it. And there's this moment where it's just, it's the glitch, right? So it's just like, it's just suspended. Um, and so when you're talking about what the, this, this fusion of the director entering um, of the glitch itself, so the narrative within the narrative, and then, and then your music, I mean, how do all of those elements um, come together? I mean, it just seems like such a, a com complex um, organism that all of these things come together. So what, what brings them together for you? I mean, is it, yeah, I just, Curious if that's a clear enough question. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, it is. I know what you mean. Yeah, it, it everything, the score, the soundtrack derived from the from the film and the, the visuals have to be created simultaneously. So mm -hmm. I'm surrounded by multiple computers that and okay. you know, so it has to be for it to really integrate, and all three have to integrate, or else because I don't want the visuals to just be eye candy, and I don't want the score and and the parts to just you know be, be um arbitrary or, or each one has to have equal weight and i and it's tricky because if you're if you have something something so iconic like I, I, um you know in, in malfunction leader um so that that I, explores different scenes with films, either ex, uh, musical scenes. So the, the part that I think you're talking about, the sound of music part is actually Mother Superior, the nun who has such a crazy vibrato. And so what I did was I, I slowed it down and sort of scrubbed it so I could find overtones and things like that and made a synthesizer out of her vibrato so that that could become an instrument and it's completely its own instrument. So that yeah. and yeah. then create the foundation um, for, for the piano then to embellish and play with. And, I, and so there's scenes I use, there's also scenes from My, My Fair Lady where again, the, the pianist and the singer, uh, sorry, I meant pianist and singer earlier, have to join in into a context that maybe we've seen before, maybe not because not everybody's seen the movies, but that shouldn't, that shouldn't matter. But enter into a scenario where there's suddenly brought in something from the past is brought into the now and not only that it's brought into the concert hall so you're not expecting mother superior's vibrato or um travis bickle from taxi driver to suddenly be singing alongside a singer and a pianist completely interacting and yeah. it, it because there's this you know this this strong vision on stage and this iconic sound you know, from the or or um yeah sound from a, a yeah from a movie you know a line from a text from a dialogue from a movie which is not supposed to be in a score it's not supposed to be even it's not even sung and there's no sing it's not a musical taxi driver <laughs> but i really want the the both the, the performers and the audience to travel that move past that um fourth wall that fifth wall and enter into a domain that isn't meant for anything else other than it's not supposed to be but it what happens is that the, the performers ha are, are now completely engaged with something. Often the icon on the screen no longer is alive or people have forgotten it or people know it very well. But what has happened is that it's completely sort of transformed into classical music or music where it doesn't mm -hmm. belong. So mm -hmm. now it, it's, it's now notated. So it's, it's on the score, it's notated and now it belongs somewhere else. So it and it's necessary for 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 that piece to be um, performed. It needs everyone there, not just screen, not just the sound. It needs everyone there. It's not enough just to have what's on the screen. The it, the performer has to fully engage with this lively, you know, intense vision on the on the screen. So the performer then has to um, sort of transform themselves and become meld with them, and yeah. so. Yeah, so ex expression and dy dynamics and um, almost split personalities in, the, in that piece in order to, for it to work. It's fascinating because it's like, it's like an extension. 
it's it's like another universe, another dimension. That's the word I'm looking for of what what we began this conversation with, which is about objects, those inanimate objects taking on yeah. lives and um, and behavior and dialogue. But now yeah. you know, entering film and visuals, and it's 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 incredible. It's really incredible um, what you're doing and what you're exploring. Uh, as as a as a musician as a composer it's it's uh, it's really amazing um i'll like stop fan fangirling over here <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just want to make sure okay I, I think i have time for maybe two more questions so um i wanted to ask you a, a bit more practical of a question which or, or logistical is that you are a composer and a performer um and how do you find those two, do you, do you find those two things complement one another? And um, how do you find that relationship? Is it changing? Is it you're composing more sometimes, you're performing more, and have you had difficulties merging them? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and something I, I just, I, spoke, I, I speak about often, but I spoke about just recently. Um, performing, a, a, performing and I only perform in my my own pieces just because there's no <laughs> there's no time you know it's right. just it's so time consuming every but um it's really um such an interesting uh how did I articulate this the other day but when so I, I've been in the situation of course where I'm in the audience listening to my piece and of course I put all this work and then you know I've been to the rehearsals and of course I, I, I interact engage you know not in, during the performance but beforehand with the players but there's something about creating a piece and I also send a part to myself that I've played that I you know prepared and I am also part of that um that group of people that has to realize now now join together to to make this happen it's not enough you know i've written it but i'm also now essential in the in the uh performance or the complete mm -hmm. actualization of the piece that mm -hmm. is something and and, you're, and i'm on stage with them and i have my depending on what you know plethora of instruments that i'm responsible for and i have responsibility in order to, for us as mm -hmm. you know, the being now we have formed one entity in many ways and we have to make this happen and i can no longer you know i can't be thinking about should, you know i can't be thinking about anything else really i can't be thinking like a composer i have to be thinking like mm -hmm. that's an that's an amazing that just adds for me um another another uh portal in the piece another way of absorbing because you're joined in with all these people that are now devoted to making this happen mm -hmm. and that's quite a great um experience and bond and spirited i don't it, there's there's a spirituality there there's something that <laughs> exists that happens that cannot happen anywhere else um not just taking anything away from you know composers who don't perform that's not what i'm saying but there's something that happens on stage when you're all together realizing this goal together and so you enter time stops almost or you know that's kind of a a cliche but it does like time, yeah. <laughs> time time behaves differently it, it actually speeds up but it behaves differently on stage for sure and you look at each other differently and you breathe differently and you in, you know you communicate differently and after it's done there's a different sort of connection afterwards we all do that together and it's, and and i know that you know i write pieces for example um the, the pieces with film have now been formed into what I call the Criterion Collection. So they're, um, and there are various lengths. Some of them, depending on, you know, what people, how the set lengths of people that they, they request, but they have been 90 minutes long. And when I, when the video starts and the click starts and everything starts, we are all just engaged. We, we look at each other like there's an intensity. We're all like, it's, it's a crazy, it's a crazy mm. feeling. And, and when we're done, we're, 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 you know, we've been through something, um, we've gone to a different place, you know, yes. we've just gone through a, a different experience together and it's like nothing else. And we yeah. talk about it afterwards, we use a language that no one else can understand. And we're like, you know, that, you know, you know, we're trying to, to articulate what we've been through and we can do it. 
simply by grunts or, or you know, you know, it's it's yeah. a different it's a different way of um, it's a different everything. Mm -hmm. on, on, on page. You know, and I, then, I, yeah. No, no, no. Sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just I was just going to say that then of course that must add so much to you then as a, as a composer because just the memory of that experience and the the seeking that experience, yes. seeking that experience. I think ultimately what it, how I define it is very emotional and so when I when when experiences that I want that again and again and again and that's ultimately why I do what I do so I want things I have ideas on what emotion is and what interests what things interest me and and some and yes they can be tricky they, they can be um you know uh un, you know very precise and and they have all these all these adjectives that they you know how to describe I want to I want to go through that I want my players to go through that I want to go through that with them it's you know it's it and I but the, the ultimate goal is to go through emotions and so you know when a, pl a player comes up to me and says every time I play that that part of Kubrick Etudes with um, with uh, uh, Danny Torrance on the on the tricycle or the the, mm -hmm. the twins mm -hmm. I, I create sort of a corral with it and so it you know goes you know into a whole other portal he's like I get I, I just start crying or I, just, I get really scared or that. so it's you know and, and it affects the way it's played you know I'll, I'll yeah. go over yeah. this player and yeah I'm waiting I'm I'm counting bars until my entry but we're not we're just sort of you know feeling it so it's it's really hard to describe but I think ultimately it's the emotional impact that needs a lot it needs certain things in order for it to be to get there but if it's not emotional then I then I, I, I well I, I it's always emotional <laughs> you know yeah. when we're all together yeah. and so that's yeah. ultimately yeah. what it's all about for, for me. It's, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> um, so we're actually out of time. I, I um, could talk to you for like at least easily another hour, but um, so maybe we just have to have you back at some point. But <laughs> Nicole, thank you so much for making, making time and for sharing your thoughts uh, it today was on, on, on so many. On your so thank you. Yeah, I, um, I, I feel like interrupting you. Oh, sorry. Now's the time where freezing's happening, so this is terrible. Yes. But um, I, it was, a, it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure to be your guest today, and it was, it went so quickly. And uh, I, yeah, I would love to speak with with you again. It was, it was great. Thank you. Super. Thank you, Nicole, and and for everyone who tuned in today, um, make sure that you check out Nicole's really great playlist, um, super varied playlist from her from her own works of, that she's proud of, but also. Um, um, film music and um, and lots of really cool 20th century uh, music and Bach too. So uh, make sure you check it out. It's linked underneath this episode and I'll see you all next Wednesday. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely week.